Well, good morning. I got to tell you a little Christmas story because every time I hit this season and we're into the, um, the Christmas carols and hymns and things, I'm reminded I actually spiritually grew up in a little Baptist church in Prineville, Oregon. I'd come to faith later in life, and that's kind of where all my spiritual journey really took off was there. And uh, I was new to the church, had a wife and one child, and got recruited to be in the choir. And the guy that was leading the choir said, oh, yeah, Luke, you'll be great. Just come in. I said, I don't know anything about music. He goes, well, I'm going to have you stand right next to my brother. And he, uh, you know, he's a bass and maybe a baritone, and you just follow him. And I said, okay, you know, but you're talking about people that know music, right? And so everybody's reading the music, and I'm trying to figure it out. And we're going to do this Christmas cantata. Well, we went through a number of practices and things. And then, then Greg came up to me and he said, hey, Luke, I got, how about if you're the narrator? <laughs> and I went, yeah, I think that would be really good. Um, so anyway, I became the narrator. Uh, it was just a nice way of saying, you know, you can't carry a tune in a bucket, so we'll just have you read. Well, uh, here's hoping that your Thanksgiving was good and that there was plenty to be thankful for. It was a full house at my house, and I was telling Jeff that uh, we're, we had everybody at Thanksgiving. It's usually one or the other, but three kids and eight grandkids, and everybody was there for Thanksgiving this time around. And um, yeah, I'm tired. How's that? <laughs> Tired of that situation, but not tired of this situation, which is Advent. And for some of us, maybe that's a really common term. Yeah, we're, we're used to it. This is the coming of Christ, the first coming. There's another one. He's coming back. But this was the first one, and that's what Advent really means. And the season, according to the church calendar, starts now. It starts on this last Sunday in November, and it's the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And so I'm here this morning, and Curtis, who's from uh, Mercy Fellowship down in um, Marysville, Curtis is on staff there, and he'll be up and preach next week. And then uh, Chris Rich, who is the lead pastor there, as well as on staff at uh, Church Venture, which I am as well, but Chris will come up and preach that next one. I think um, it, it goes peace and hope. Chris comes up and preaches joy. And Curtis will come back and finish out with love. So it's, uh, we're kind of looking at those passages. Jeff read to you that verse out of Isaiah. That whole chapter really is worth it to take a look at in the Christmas season as Isaiah is prophesying what, is, what came to pass with Christ coming. But this morning we start with peace. And before we get started, I just want you to know that I'm going to come out of Ephesians chapter 2. 11 to 18, which might sound a little unusual when we start to talk about peace, but hopefully it'll become a little bit more obvious. But I think all of us would agree that if I say the word peace, you have an immediate connotation. It's kind of like folding your arms. Could you do that for me? Just fold your arms. We kind of know. Now, as quick as you can, fold them the other way. It's a little tougher, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of like, how do I, which, how, how do, I do that? Yeah, I, I think what I would say to you this morning is I'm, I'm looking for the opportunity for us to see this idea of peace, this Prince of Peace, Jesus coming as the Prince of Peace, in a different perspective. Kind of our arms folded the other way. Like, what, what would this look like from a different angle? Now, the working definition of peace, I think, for all of us would be the absence of war or conflict. Does that sound right? That would be peace. Now, there is war and conflict all around us. They're at the, at the international level, at the national level, at the local level, inside our own families. Um, there's all kinds of conflict that occurs. And so there's conflict that occurs at local and family levels that really isn't war, but it is conflict, so the absence of that conflict would then be peace. Would that be right? Well, the Old Testament uses a word for uh, peace that is shalom, 
You familiar with that term, shalom? A lot of times it's used as a greeting in the Middle Eastern world, but shalom, shalom means peace. In the New Testament, the word is irena, and that's a Greek word, and they essentially mean the same thing, but peace has a very much more robust definition when used in those languages, both Hebrew and Greek. Uh, they have a much fuller meaning. It's, it's the idea of completeness or wholeness when you say shalom or irena. Life is complex, is it not? There's lots of moving parts, lots of relationships and situations that we're involved in. And when any one of those things are out of alignment in our life, then we're, we're missing our shalom, our peace. It starts to break down when those things are misaligned. Life really at that point is no longer whole. It's not complete. It needs to be restored. So I'm just going to have you think of a broken relationship right now. Yeah, uh-oh. Uh, broken relationship, and what does that feel like around the holiday season? Now, sometimes we can just kind of slide by, look the other way, ignore it, but there are times in our life when that comes right to the front and we know and we feel that incompleteness, if you will. There's, an, there's a non-integrity. In fact, life feels a little disintegrated at that point. To bring peace is to bring shalom to make whole, to restore, literally to reconcile, to bring the healing to a broken relationship is to bring shalom and peace. And you can kind of see where I'm going here. It's getting telegraphed. But the world is in a bad spot. Generally speaking, the relationship between man and God has been broken. That happened a long time ago. And peace has not reigned. So as we start to talk about peace, what I want you to do is think about your arms folded the other way because the different perspective here is that peace really is a proactive term. It's this kind of restoration that is not just merely the absence of fighting, but the actions of the once opposing sides um, now are working together. And it actually brings about what, what we would call the, the human environment of flourishing. So rather than just not being at conflict, we're actually together and life flourishes. It's not just a broken relationship that, well, I forgive you, well, I forgive you, but there isn't any change in the relationship it really is much more than that. It's bringing that relationship back together and moving forward together in life and, and, and with a, a very direct flourishing. So that's what we celebrate today, is the coming of the Prince of Peace in this first Advent Sunday, the coming of Jesus. Sinless, and he was in perfect relationship with his Father, and perfect relationship with every other human he ran into. Now, you might think, well, like, I know some situations where Jesus was getting after it pretty good at somebody. Yes, he did. He, he was confrontive when he needed to be, but his relationship wasn't broken. He was completely sinless. So that's what we celebrate, him coming. This is what Isaiah was prophesying about. And the nation had not known peace for a long time, in Isaiah's time. In fact, they'd known, uh, well, at this point, when Isaiah's prophesying this, the nation was headed into exile. Another nation was coming to conquer them and pack them off to their world. So it was pretty dire. And so Isaiah is talking about this coming Messiah and what he's going to be, and he's going to be the Prince of Peace. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to camp out in Ephesians 2, 11 to 18, and I'll read it here in a minute. But as the text describes rather thoroughly, 
uh, what peace Jesus actually brings to those who would put them, their trust in them is very different than what we think of as peace. And that's what we're going to take a look at. Now, Ephesus. Ephesus, uh, if, if you know anything about the life of Paul, his strategy really was to go to cities that were hubs of sorts and plant churches there that uh, people would be rather transient, perhaps be there for a while and move back to other parts of the world. But there were definitely a, a hub in which a lot of people crossed through. Ephesus was no different. And it had uh, a Jewish population for sure, but man, it had foreigners coming from all around the world and lots of major religions that were housed there in Ephesus. And Paul is writing this letter and is going to give them some rather profound teaching. And if you looked at, at, at the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul really spends the first half, the first three chapters, talking about what our faith is, and then the last three are kind of how we live that out. So you're going to hear some themes in this chapter that you're very familiar with, and I'm going to ask you just to go with me. It might feel a little tedious, but I promise you it won't be. We'll take a look at this from a couple different angles, and hopefully it'll all be um, fresh for you. All right, so let me read this to you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you, Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. This is the word of the Lord. All right, Paul addresses these Ephesian believers who are mainly Gentile at this point, and he's asking them to remember. That's his first encouragement. Remember your past, your roots. And if you will, he starts with, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh. <laughs> so here are your roots you Gentiles, and we can, we can identify with that. I'm assuming that none of us are Jewish here. Maybe that's an unfair assessment, but we're all Gentiles at this point. So we're going to remember our roots. What, what were they? This is, this is just uh, Paul saying, I need you to remember where you came from. It's more than simply saying that they're from other nations, from foreign countries. Their foreignness is part of their flesh, rooted in their very nature. Now, I'll say this once or twice later on as well, but Jews at this point, and maybe even to today, only recognize two races in the world, Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Gentiles. Jews represent the people of God whom the covenants and the promises were given to. And Jews knew that, know that, this is their heritage. And the Gentiles did not have any part in those promises. Hmm. So how were you regarded? Paul's saying, this is how you were regarded. You were regarded as pagans, belittled by the religious elite. 
regarded as foreigners, deprived of hope. And then he wants them to remember what it meant for your own sin, you Gentiles, that would make you despicable in your own eyes and in God's as well. Now, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more cognizant I am of my sin, the more I realize it. And I don't know if you've, maybe I shared this with you last time, but I've had this recurring thought here for a couple of years of that scenario that preachers love to give of you standing before the pearly gates, right? You're dead, and now you're going to stand before Peter or Gabriel or Jesus or whatever the end is like. And the question is asked, why should I let you into heaven? Now, we know the answer. We know that answer. But if I'm honest at this moment, if asked that question, what I would be prepared to say today versus 20, 40 years ago would be, you, uh, you shouldn't let me go to heaven. I don't deserve to go to heaven. In fact, you should send me to hell right now. For you, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've thought in completeness. But if that were to run on the video screen, it would be hideous. So that's where you should send me. But I would have a but, right? I would have a but to that whole thing. And I'd say, but <laughs> that guy, Jesus said that if I would put my trust in him, Amen. that he would give me his righteousness. Amen. Well, Paul is saying to this Ephesian church, remember where he came from. This Advent season, as we think about the Prince of Peace coming, it's, it's, it's appropriate for us to go, where did I come from? Well, that's that first understanding of my, my identity is rooted in my flesh. But the next part of verse 15 says, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Now that kind of looks like, what in the world is Paul talking about? Well, here's, here's the simple explanation. For the Jews, the sign of circumcision was more than just a physical distinction. It was just that. It was males only. But it really, it was a, it was a mark of covenantal privilege. It was a mark of social standing. You were the people of God. And it was a mark of spiritual purity. You were not like the Gentiles. You were God's very own possession. You were the people of God. And so the Jews viewed themselves that way, and they viewed the Gentiles in the opposite camp of all of that. Uncircumcised, no social standing, and, and spiritually impure. Paul's saying, remember your rejection. And although the Jews call themselves holy, their conclusion that they are right before a holy God is based on what is done in the body of hands of men. That's what Paul talks about there. Is made in the flesh by hands. What he's saying is that it was a human effort to try and make you right standing before God, you Jews, that, that you were relying on human efforts to give you your spiritual status. It's, it's Paul's way of saying that the Jews' fleshly status is now no different than the Gentiles. So he's leveling the playing field now. Paul uses the in-the-flesh echo to remind Gentiles and Jews that the natural state of all people is merely of the flesh. So we're all of the flesh. We are remarkably human. And in our flesh, this is inescapable. So 
it's crucial to, to have the understanding and look at the perspective that Paul has now put Jews and Gentiles on the same plane for different reasons, but on the same plane. All right, so we got through one verse. Wow. Well, let's take a look at this next verse. Verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. He's still talking to the Gentiles. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and stranger to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. If I had to reword this, I would say Paul's saying, now just remember the consequences of your past. What were the consequences of not being God's people? Well, you were alienated from any kind of meaningful community. You were alienated from God's people. And you can see that covenants and promises are in the plural here. So while we would understand the one covenant, but there are multiple covenants in Scripture that dictated all kinds of things to the people of God, how they were to structure their families and how they were to pass on property and how they were to live. There were promises. And if you went back to Deuteronomy and just looked at the last sermon given by Moses, he says, hey, if you do all these things, you will be blessed. And he listed all of them. God promises his blessing. And what happens if you don't do them? You'll be cursed. Well, you don't have that meaning in your life as a Gentile. You were alienated from that. And you were alienated from intimacy as well. Those covenant promises were not only the basis of Israel's relationship to God, but it was also the social glue that united families and neighbors and worshiping communities. It was a full and robust life living in that world. If you couldn't live with those, then you would be alienated from intimacy. And then the last thing you're alienated from is God himself. Look at the last part of that verse. Having no hope and without God in the world. Think of your unbelieving friends and perhaps family members right now. Aside from God, what hope could you give them for this world turning into human flourishing? Turning into peace? I have brothers and sisters who don't know the Lord. We have this discussion often. What do you hope in? Well, we just had an election. Can you put hope in our leaders? No. Can can you put hope in everybody that we're in relationship to have understanding of each other? No. It can happen for a moment, but misunderstanding is there in a heartbeat. Well, just if we just had more education, wouldn't that solve the issues? How many times have you heard somebody say that? Well, if we just had more laws or more punishment or more freedom, maybe if we just didn't have any laws, maybe that would be better. Without God, there is no hope. And that's what Paul's saying. Remember the consequences of your past. The apostles' reminders of alienation are so heavy here, so numerous and so dark, that sometimes it leaves me gasping for spiritual air. It's like, man, if you don't know God, there isn't anywhere to turn. All right, just when you think, oh, we we can't breathe, then Paul is going to give us freedom. Remember the... Remember the past, but look at verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? All right, this this may sound tedious to you, but if you don't have God, then you're trying to identify yourself 
through a multitude of different ways. I am who I am because of who I married. I am who I am because of my job. I am who I am because of my children. My identity is wrapped up in all kinds of things that are trying to bring peace and meaning to my life. And Paul's saying, remember all those things. Those are pretty futile, and they don't really bring peace. But now, in Christ Jesus, Paul has already declared that those who were pagan by birth and religious by ritual, the Jews, all of that is in the flesh. But now you're in Christ. In the flesh, we're all hopelessly human, imprisoned in our humanity, unable to escape the isolation from community and intimacy and God. But now, but now, I'm no longer in the flesh. If you've put your trust in Jesus, you're no longer in the flesh. Instead, you are in Christ Jesus. And you're not imprisoned in humanity, but actually you're united to divinity. Well, that is a very different identity, isn't it? Now, here's, here's the issue. I can speak this to you. I can try and reword it and show you this is who you are. But there is responsibility on your part to appropriate that. This is your arms being folded the other way. I have to see this from a new perspective. This is my identity. I am in Christ. He goes on in this verse and says, uh, but, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, you know, you, I suppose you and I could figure out, yes, I've brought, been brought near to, to God through Jesus Christ, but Paul has a couple thoughts in here that he's, he's, he's marrying up. The, the, this language uh, brings to mind the contrast of the Jew and Gentile that was formed as the backdrop of the whole passage. That's what Paul is saying. There's a difference here. He says, uh, he's saying here, the presence of the glory of Yahweh in his temple meant that the Jews of the nation of Israel had the privilege of drawing near to God. God dwelt in the temple, and they could, on an annual basis, go and make sacrifice for their sin, their sin atoned for by sacrificing an animal and being near to God. And consequently, all the other nations were far off. They didn't have that. There's no atonement available for them. Not only are they separated geographically, but spiritually as well. But now, all are brought near. The fleshly corruptions that separate us from community, intimacy, and worship are overcome. And they're overcome by our union with Christ. In other words, in him, all distinctions, hear me very clearly, all distinctions of race and nationality, pagan or pious, young or old, sinner or saint, prideful and wounded, offender and offended, all of them implode. They collapse in on themselves. There are no more distinctions. You can talk about race relations until you're blue in the face. Let me give you a little secret. For God, there are no races but one, called the human race. And there will be no peace without Jesus. We've tried peace in a hundred thousand different ways to somehow reconcile everybody that's different in the world. Be thankful this morning that the Prince of Peace came. That's the only way we ex escape this. How would I say this? Well, first of all, uh, you wouldn't know this about me, 
but my mother was Mexican. She immigrated from Mexico with her family when she was a small child. And you're looking at me going, I don't think that's true. You're looking kind of white. Okay, but she stood about that tall. And her maiden name was Rodriguez. She had seven sisters and a brother. Okay, um, I'm 50%. I'm half of her. Ah, oh, amen. However, here's the deal. This morning, you can take all those labels, old white guy, half Mexican, whatever it is, and paste this right over the top of all of them. This is what Paul's saying. Paste this label on top of all of them. God's own child. Heir to all of the promises and glory of heaven. Brother and sister to Jesus Christ. That's our label. That's their label. That, that's pretty radical, is it not? Okay, how did that happen? Did God just snap his fingers and go, okay, you're all mine? Well, no, peace is costly. Reconciliation is costly. It takes massive amount of humility and love to overcome brokenness and sin. Yeah, it's, it's almost incalculable. How can this all happen? Well, look at uh, the last part of verse 13. You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Through the blood. That's the way that this occurs. When we read these words, the first thought that comes to mind is of the cleansing power of the blood of our Savior. When he took this, this, the sin, our sin, on his body, his human body, on the cross. But there's much more to learn there. We're not just merely beneficiaries of the blood of his death, but we are recipients of the blood of his life. His blood and his life now flow through us because the grave couldn't hold him and he rose from the grave. And that blood that cleanses now courses through you and I. That label, God's own child. You're related. You're connected to divinity. We're not merely forgiven of our sin. We are filled with the benefits of his righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Now, being from a Mexican mother, I grew up as a child uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. And I think that my mother always harbored the thought that I would be a priest one day. She never really said that to me because she wasn't that type of person, but I think it was always kind of in the back of her mind. She named me after one of the apostles. My dad got to name the firstborn, and then she got to name me. There were five of us. I grew up in the Catholic Church. I was an altar boy. I went to Catholic schools. I, I know Catholic theology. I'm not saying I knew it as a kid, I knew it sort of, but as I got older, I certainly knew it. There's a difference between Catholics and Protestants. Maybe there's more than one, but there's one that's key. I do believe that Catholics can be saved. There can be saved Catholics. But their understanding would be different than the theology that's stated. And, and really clearly, this has everything to do with the blood that runs through you and I if we put our faith in Jesus. For a Catholic, they would say to you that Jesus indeed died on the cross to save us from our sins. However, when you get to righteousness, they would say that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection allows for that his righteousness to be infused in you. 
to be placed inside you, but you must live it out. You now have the ability to live righteously. That sounds pretty good. I remember as a kid going to bed at night for a long time and having the same simple prayer. Lord, when I die, please allow for a priest to be present so that I can give him my last confession and be absolved of my sin. I remember praying that as a kid. Like all, That's all that really needs to occur. Just a priest needs to be there. That was infused righteousness. As a kid, I went to confession every week. You couldn't take communion if you hadn't gone to confession on Friday. So I did, so that I could take communion on Sunday. You had to be absolved of your sin. Your righteousness is infused, but it's only as good as your ability to live righteously, to not sin. Okay, so Protestantism stands over here and understands the gospel, I believe rightly, by saying, no, it's not infused righteousness, it's imputed righteousness. This is a de declaration, a, a forensic statement. You are declared righteous. Literally, when God looks at you as one who has put their faith in Jesus, he sees the righteousness of Christ. No matter what you or I have done, that's what he sees. And that's what's known as imputed righteousness. Well, his blood forgives us of our sin, and his righteousness is now given to us. We get his righteousness, his holiness, his redemption. That's what true life is. And that's what you and I have. If we have put our faith in him. We all remain unmistakably human. Creatures of the flesh. But now we are in Christ Jesus through his blood. And although we remain full of weakness, lies, lust, pride, and prejudice. We are God's beloved children now and forever. Okay, I'm just telling you that you can get somewhat complacent about that imputed righteousness. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Remember where you came from. And when you understand what has been given to you, allow your gratefulness to well up. Because quite frankly, your fight with sin and all the complexity of life and everything that brings conflict, that is a result of trying to white-knuckle your righteousness. Trying to be good. No, allow the thankfulness and gratefulness to be the engine that drives you. Be grateful. Oh, yeah, like that song. Count your blessings. Yeah, that funky little song that maybe some of us learned. Every day, count your blessings. Yeah, here's the deal. If you'll take a moment in your day and stop and just give thanks. You know what? Take, take, a, take an egg timer. We don't use those anymore. Take your phone. Take your phone. Set it for one minute. One minute, the alarm goes off. Thank God for everything that you can think of. Just do it once a day for one minute. Hey, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You'll get to that minute and go, no, I still got some more. Yeah, I got some more, Lord. I, I have a few more things. This is what drives us into a new understanding. This is what drives us into peace, shalom, irena, wholeness, completeness. We have this kinship with God. It is our very life. It's our hope. It's our identity. All because of his blood. So I told you, the Jews thought only two races, us and everybody else. And what God did right here in these verses, according to Paul, is he put an end to that ancient enmity, that ancient conflict. Gone. You're all the same. God's own child. No more hostility for you with anybody else in the world. No more hostility. 
So how, how does Christ bring that kind of peace? Well, look at verse 14. For he himself is our peace. It's not that he just merely brings it. He's actually peace. Who has made us both one. So it's us and everybody else in the world are one who have put their faith in him and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. On the cross, his body was broken down and bled out. That's what Paul's saying. And as a result, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. He goes on to say in verse 15, with his body in the flesh, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Did Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection eliminate the law? Well, no, not the moral law, not the Ten Commandments, not the law that would re represent our moral life. No. That's still intact. But the ceremonial law is now abolished. The ordinances. You must come and make atonement for your sin annually. You and your whole household and bring a lamb. He's going to bleed out. Don't have to do that anymore. Oh, the, the priests, the only ones that could enter the Holy of Holies. Now, that, that curtain has been rent. There is no more Holy of Holies in a physical location. All that ceremonial law is gone. When Jesus Christ offered his flesh upon the cross, he made all distinctions of the flesh irrelevant for any religious privilege. It's irrelevant. This isn't about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. That's the recognition. Now, there's great freedom there, right? There also can be license. Should we go on sinning? Paul says in another letter, no. Perish the thought. Don't think that way. Remember your past. And that all of your sin is forgiven. And then act accordingly. Amen. 15, let's just keep reading. So he abolishes the law, the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace. Well, here's, it. here's his solution. I just wait, make one man, new, new man, a new humanity. Because Christ's blood brings peace not only by destroying the ancient enmity, but also by creating a new humanity. This sacrifice of Jesus makes the shedding of blood in the temple sacrifices no longer necessary. In his flesh, he met the requirements of the law. He led a sinless life. And he also accepted the punishment of our sin. that the law demanded. So here's the deal. The Jew no longer must sacrifice. We've talked about that. And the Gentiles no longer separated from the atonement. Both are made pure. Brought together. Shalom. Peace. Flourishing. All right. We're almost at the end. Take a look at verse 16. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. Well, the only way that God, that we can see how Christ's blood brings peace with others, it, it only makes sense when you perceive how Christ's blood brings peace with God, period. In verse 16, Paul is saying that it was God's purpose to create one new man out of two previous men, thus making peace between them, and also in this one new body reconcile both to God through the cross. 
So both will have to come to Calvary. Both bodies, or both men now as one body. So it's not just a reconciliation between the individual and the Lord. The reconciliation is corporate. This gets a little sticky. All I'm saying here is you want to solve the problems of conflict and war in the world. There's only one way. All must go to Calvary. You can write as many peace treaties as you want to and ceasefires and anything else that you want to in human creation. But the Prince of Peace will bring actual peace and, and the only way for us to have that is to meet at the foot of Calvary yes. Amen. and to proclaim Jesus as the Savior, the only answer. So the full reconciliation that God intends occurs as the two different races representing all people on earth in one body are reconciled. So we actually have to live this out. Okay, but there's more hostility. Take a look at this verse. And, it's verse 16, might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Does that sound violent to you? Well, there is a prince of peace who came and killed hostility. The second hostility mentioned here is not between men and men, Jew and Gentile, me and anybody else. That's the first hostility. But rather, the second one is hostility between heaven and earth, God and man. By the cross on which his son died, God put to death the hostility between heaven and earth, between God and man. If you don't know Jesus, what does the Bible say you are? Well, Paul says you're an enemy of God. There is hostility between you and God. That's what we all were prior to salvation. An enemy. Yet when we were still sinners... Christ saved us. Think about that for a second. This must be really clear. You go overboard on a cruise ship liner. Did you guys hear about that story this week? It was a guy, he was in the Gulf of Mexico, 28 years old, and he got up from a bar, it was like in the middle of the afternoon or whatever, and then by dinner time they couldn't find him. And they called everybody, Coast Guard and whatever, and the boat turned around, and who knows how long he'd been gone or whatever, but they actually found him. I don't think I've read a story about that happening in my lifetime, but they found him in the Gulf of Mexico. Crazy. I think he should have just saved himself. And did you do that? Oh, if you saved yourself, you wouldn't need a savior, would you? Okay, just understand that all of our human effort will not equal salvation. You can't save yourself. Amen. You need a Savior. Jesus kills the hostility on the cross. He absorbs all the wrath of God, killing all of hostility. God said, I can't live with sin. There must be the shedding of blood. And so this perfect, sinless, true human being dies on the cross this prince of peace, proactive, and he's coming. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we can have true peace now. I will tell you that God chooses to do far more through our oneness with each other than through our isolation from each other. So be a true witness of this peace. Be a true witness. Remember that label? God's own child. Hey, nothing can touch you. You're his. Doesn't matter what you do or where you go. You are absolutely secure. 
The Prince of Peace has guaranteed it because he killed hostility. That's who you are if you put your faith in Jesus. That's who you are as a result of the Prince of Peace coming to a little town in Bethlehem. What we celebrate today, be a true witness of that reconciliation. Be ready and willing to reconcile. Be secure. Be humble. Be loving. It says here, verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. That's everybody. That's what Jesus did. We should do the same. Preach true peace. Give people what they need. A true identity. Show them the way. By your actions. Being willing to reconcile. Broken relationship, you be the first. You go towards it. I've been in this touchy situation with my youngest son, wife, three kids. Very unfortunate thing happened in our relationship as couples, my wife and I and them, about, well, it was just before COVID. You know, it's one of those family things and it was really difficult. And then COVID hits and you can't see anybody. And that just amplified that whole thing, right? And um, you could feel the distance. There was all kinds of problems. They weren't coming over even after COVID. And I'm supposed to be the dad, you know, the mature one, right? And I really wasn't in the middle of the original conflict, but I am one flesh with my wife. So it was mine, too. So two months ago, I called him. He's a pastor. And I said, hey, can we grab coffee? He said, yeah. And we went and had coffee and kind of chit-chatted. And I said, I just, I just want to talk. And he said, well, what about? And I said, well, things are broken. And he wasn't ready to kind of jump into that whole thing. And so I said, so what's your hesitancy? And he said, um, you haven't been dad to me through all of this. Well, if you live long enough, maybe it won't be true for some of you. It was true for me. Having lived this long, all of my kids have come back and told me how I wasn't something for them. <laughs> That's what kids do, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a really difficult thing. And I, in all truthfulness, tried to be very humble and receiving. It was difficult. That's not my personality, to be humble and receiving. And I listened and I said, I'm really sorry. And we got together a second time. I don't know, it was two or three weeks later. And we chatted a little more and we got a little bit further. And he said, what are you thinking, Dad? And I said, I'm thinking that we just go. We just keep going. And so we set the third day. And he was out of town for a little while. And he came back into town. And we were going to meet on a Wednesday. And on a Monday, he goes, hey, can I, can I push that date out? Because, man, I'm just swamped. It's right before Thanksgiving and da 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 Can we push it? Or it was the week prior to Thanksgiving week. He said, can we push it out to Thanksgiving week? And I said, actually, your sister's coming into town. It's just a zoo. I don't know that we'll, I can get the time. And he goes, well, can we just push it out? And I said, sure. And I came back to the house, and I just lamented and poured it all out to my wife. Any of you guys ever done that? You know, it's just kind of like, you know, and you know what? I'm not going to call him. I'm not going to call him. He's going to have to call me. 
because, you know, I'm trying. It just feels like maybe it's not that important to him. And What do you think she said? I refer to her as the Holy Spirit often. Uh, yeah, she said, uh, no, Luke. No, you, you will pursue him. You will call him. And I'm thinking, it's not even my problem. You have more of a problem than I do. I'm thinking of all these weird things. And, and she's going, no, you will pursue him. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> and, you know, about five minutes later, I'm like, yeah, I think I'll pursue him. <laughs> uh, here's the point. You have to stop and think of your past. You have to stop at that moment and say, who am I? You have to stop in that moment and say, what's at stake? Yeah. We both know Jesus, Adam and I. We both know him. It requires us to preach the gospel to each other. That's what it requires. And you say, well, if you already both know him, I'm not talking about the plan of salvation. I'm talking about the gospel, the good news, that the Prince of Peace has come, and he's reconciled us to God, and we, as two of his children, should be reconciled to each other. What's the excuse? There is none. We need to preach to each other far and near, Okay, last verse. Verse 18, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Christ's blood brings peace for each of our souls. Through one spirit, access to the Father. Paul is saying in no uncertain terms, you have access to the God of the universe. Stop and think about it. You have access, as one, in one spirit, have access to the God of the universe. That is shalom. That is completeness. That is wholeness. That is flourishing. Shalom through Christ alone. Just a little walk back through. In verse 13, Christ sheds his blood. Christ alone sheds his blood. In verse 15, he sacrifices his flesh. Christ alone sacrifices his flesh. In verse 16, Christ alone kills hostility. You see, real peace requires a real savior. Not a strong leader, not a good politician, not more laws, not more freedoms, not more restrictions. Real peace requires a real savior. So on this day, you and I say, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, I am thankful for Valley Community Church this morning that would put up with a preacher. Really flawed, but um, your child. I'm grateful for the witness of this church in this community. And I would ask that you would give all present the opportunity to feel your peace, to deeply understand what has been given through Jesus Christ and his blood. God, fire up their engine of gratitude. Cause them to rehearse in their minds and with their words, 
all those things that they're thankful for. Give them pause to look at those pieces that are not integrated in their lives right now, the complexity of life and where things are not right. God, may be, they be the agent of reconciliation. Give them security and power, humility, a staid presence, a non-anxious presence in all of their relationships because they belong to you. May they be true witnesses of the peace that you bring, that only you can bring. God, I love the Advent season, and we do bid you come and welcome to Jesus Christ. I pray all these things for his sake and for his glory alone. Amen.